people that get concerned with the candles burning down all the way. So we decided to put them out when I got up to talk. I have to confess, <clears throat> my pocket watch stopped working, so I won't know when to stop. Well, you tell me what time it is when I ask you. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, please find the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, then find chapter 2. And we're going to look at the first seven verses in Ephesians chapter 2. And if you don't have your Bible, you can pull out a phone app. Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Paul writes this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the perfect gift. Jesus gives the perfect gifts. One of the gifts that Jesus was born to give was the gift of eternal life. Last week we looked at the gift of forgiveness, but today we're going to look at the gift of eternal life. So just to get you thinking, let me ask you this. How and when did he give us that gift, that gift of eternal life? And how does his birth figure into it? Because we're going to talk about that and much more this morning in our sermon entitled Life or Death. But first, take a moment and find a few people that you haven't had a chance to greet and give them a hug, a handshake, or a high five. Hey, Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jackie. How are you? Good to see you. 
Excited. As you're making your way back to your seats, I want to remind you of an announcement that I failed to put into the bulletin for next Sunday. Next Sunday is the third Sunday, and so we have our men's breakfast next Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. And so I know some of you will bring the usual that you bring, but make sure that you let Brian, Brian, would you raise your hand? Make sure you let Brian know what you're going to be bringing for the men's breakfast next Sunday so he can make sure that everything is covered. I got to tell you, our men's breakfast, we eat well. Would you bow your heads and let me pray? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity of this morning. Father, thank you for the testimony of how you're working on the other side of the world from us. Father, thank you for the testimonies that that we hear, listen to, and share when we fellowship with each other of how you're working in our lives. Father, thank you so much that we have a life. And this morning, we're going to be talking about eternal life. So, Lord, we just pray that right now, with your word before us and your spirit in us, that you would reveal what you want for each one of us this morning. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was George Bernard Shaw who observed that the statistics about death are very impressive, he says. The statistics about death, one out of every one dies. Now, you may be thinking, why in the world is he talking about death this morning? I mean, this is the Christmas season. This is when we talk about the birth of Jesus. Well, the reason I'm talking about death is because the Christmas gift from Christ that we're talking about this morning is the gift of eternal life. And you can't talk about eternal life without talking about death. Jesus was born in a manger over 2,000 years ago to give us the gift of eternal life. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15 says that Jesus came to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, it's a pretty common thing that most people fear death. Well, not everyone. I have this one friend who says he's not afraid of death. He just doesn't want to be there when it happens. But other than him, most folks fear death. Aristotle called death the thing he feared most because it appears to be the end of everything. And then there was Jean-Paul Sartre, this existentialist philosopher. And he said, death removes all meaning from life. One survey I read said that nearly 70% of all Americans fear death, which leads me to believe that the remaining 30% aren't paying much attention. But inside each one of us, there is the deep-seated feeling that death isn't right, that death isn't natural, that we weren't made to die. The Bible teaches us that that's true. We weren't created to die. We weren't made to inhabit a grave. So it's not natural. I mean, it's not the way things should have been. And because death isn't natural, it creates all these negative kind of emotions within us. Emotions like sorrow and anxiety and and, and panic and fear and resentment and anger. But Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? eternal life, and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us this. It says, the wages, the wages, the payoff, the result of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. You see, the reason Jesus was born was to give us eternal life. And Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, we looked at last week. Remember it? It says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, I capitalized those words there in that verse to emphasize that Jesus came to redeem us from the law. The law. You remember the law. The law had several purposes. One was to help us understand the righteousness of God, to help us understand what is right and what is wrong. Unlike mortal cultures that change their morality from one generation to the next, God's morality doesn't change. God's morality was set literally in stone. And the law, the law had a penalty for sin. For disobeying the law, there was a penalty. Do you know what it was? Death. Death. The wages of sin is death. But all that changed with Jesus. Look up here at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 55 through 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The law of Moses drove home the seriousness of sin. And as Romans 6.23 said, the, the wages of sin under the law is death. But Jesus took our place. He exchanged places with us when it comes to receiving that punishment. He took our punishment. He died in our place. He died in our stead. And because of Jesus, I don't have to be afraid of death anymore. When the fullness of time had come, Jesus came to give us eternal life. When I was very young, my grandmother died. Her name was Wanda. Uh, I loved her a lot. Uh, her and my mom used to, I used to hang out with them and go shopping and my grandma would buy me all sorts of things. But she died. After the funeral, we went to the gravesite. And this was back, you know, before they laid fake grass, you know, astroturf around and had everything set up. This was back when you could see down in the hole. And I stood at the edge of the grave and I looked down into it and I remember thinking, how's my grandma ever going to get out of there? Well, as you all know, my mother was and is a godly woman. And so she explained to me all about how Jesus, Jesus rose from the grave. And because he rose, so would my grandma. Let me emphasize this one more time. The reason Jesus was born was so that we, you and I, could have eternal life. But when did Jesus give us eternal life? I mean, did he bring us eternal life when he was born in the manger? No. That happened at the cross. And because Jesus died and then rose from the dead, you and I know that we will too. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 promises, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. If Jesus hadn't died for us, there wouldn't be any hope for eternal life. I mean, Jesus died for us in order to conquer death. That's why he came. And the truth of his death was foreshadowed way before it happened by something that the wise men brought to him. You remember the wise men, you know, and they, and they brought the, these gifts. Do you remember what the gifts were? What were they? Uh, la, 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 la. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right. And each of those gifts pointed to something about who Jesus was. Think about it, gold. 
Gold was a, a gift given because he'd become our king. Frankincense. Frankincense was, was this unique incense, and it was used in, in worship in the tabernacle and in the temple. I mean, the people, the people of that time were commanded by God not to use it, not to use frankincense for common purposes. It was strictly to be used by the priest. So this gift was given to him because he would become our priest. And then there was myrrh. What in the world is myrrh? Let me tell you about myrrh. The word myrrh comes from the Hebrew mara. Mara means bitterness. Do you remember back in the book of Ruth? You remember reading, you know, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi? Naomi had lost her husband, she, and then she lost her sons, and, and she was destitute. And so in Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, Naomi says this. She says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitterness, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. The word Mara comes from the idea of bitterness that's, that associated with, that's associated with pain and suffering. And, and if you look at a Mara tree, a myrrh tree, it, it looks kind of like it's in pain and suffering. I mean, they're kind of gnarly. They're all twisted. They're, they're kind of knotted up. They, they just look like they're like in pain. But the way you get resin to make myrrh from a myrrh tree is by cutting away strips of bark. In other words, you need to cause the tree pain and suffering. And then the sap sort of just weeps its way out of those wounds. Also, something else about the myrrh tree. It's protected by all these long thorns. So maybe you can see the parallels with Christ. Jesus wore a crown of thorns given to him by those who mocked him. Jesus suffered and he felt pain on the cross in order to pay for our sins. The prophet Isaiah spoke about this in Isaiah 53, 5, when he wrote, he, talking about the Messiah, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Guess what? One of the major uses was for myrrh. Myrrh was commonly used to embalm the dead, both by the Egyptians and Jews. John chapter 19, let me give you an example. Verses 38 through 40. Later, talking about later after Jesus was taken down from the cross, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with with Jewish burial customs. So when Jesus was just a baby, the wise men gave him special gifts. They gave him gold because he became our king. They gave him frankincense because he became our priest. And they gave him myrrh because he became our sacrifice. Myrrh predicted Jesus' suffering and his death. In that simple gift, the wise men prophesied Jesus' gift to us, his gift of eternal life. Jesus died for us in order to conquer death. If he hadn't died for us, we'd have no hope of forgiveness. If he hadn't risen from the dead, there'd be no hope of eternal life. Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So because Jesus rose from the dead, I know I will too. How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? The simplest way is because 
there's an empty grave. I mean, about 500 years or so after Jesus walked the earth, there was this man named Muhammad. Uh, he taught things that, uh, that built this new religion, and, and he gathered followers, you know, uh, to that faith, to his faith, and then he died. And he was buried in the city of Medina. And you can go visit his grave today. In fact, millions of worshipers have done just that. If you were to go to Medina today and were allowed to look inside the place where his body is buried, guess what you would find? Yeah, his body. The remains of his body still there. Do you know why? Because he's dead. That's why. I mean, 500 years before Jesus was born, another man formed a religion. His name was Siddhartha. Let me say this right. Siddhartha. We know him as Buddha. He taught a great many things. He gathered a great many supporters. And eventually, of course, you know, one out of one, he died. They cremated him. But they kept a tooth. It's stored in Sri Lanka in a place called the Temple of the Tooth. If you go to Sri Lanka today and you visit the Temple of the Tooth, guess what you're going to find? Right, a tooth still there. You know why? Because Siddhartha is dead. No matter which founder of which religion you may want to, to name or, or to check out, they're all in their graves. They're still in their graves. Their remains are in their graves, but not Jesus. If you were to visit the place where Jesus was buried, what do you think you'd find? <laughs> Nothing. His body's not there. It's gone. Do you know why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death, and he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, I know I will too. Now, I'm going to prove to you. Uh, we have an eyewitness here. Cindy, would you stand up? Cindy, where did you just visit recently? Jerusalem. She went to Israel. Cindy, did you visit the place where Jesus was buried? What did you find? An empty tomb. See, we got an eyewitness. Thank you, Cindy. Now, I have another friend that went to Israel. He's a pastor. His church sent him to Israel. Anyways, he said he saw this hole in the ground in this area called the Pool of Siloam. Now, this is a picture of the Pool of Siloam. I don't know where the hole in the ground is that he was talking about. But anyways, he said he, he, he saw this hole in the ground, and it fascinated him because it was unattended. And, and, and it didn't seem to have any signs describing what was down in the hole in the ground. But he tends to be a, a bit adventurous, so he descended down the stairs into this hole. And he was amazed to find it was a cistern built by the crusaders uh, that had occupied Jerusalem ages ago. After he took a few pictures, he went back up to the surface again. And then reflecting on his adventure a little later, it, it occurred to him that nobody knew that he'd gone down there. And if something had happened to him, he'd still be down in that hole. But as he thought... <laughs> He decided he wasn't really afraid of that. I mean, it wasn't anything to be fearful of because that staircase that he walked down and then walked back up told him that others had been down there before him and that others had come back out. That's the way it is with death. Others have gone down into the grave before us. But Jesus came out. So I don't know about you, but I'm not afraid of death. There's one other thing before I close. Every time somebody becomes a Christian, every time somebody accepts Jesus as their Savior and surrenders and lets him be Lord of their life, every time I witness a baptism, I am reminded of this truth, the truth that I will rise from the dead. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that when we become Christians, we die 
to our sins. Die to our sins. Hmm. What do you do with dead things? What do you do with dead people? Well, you bury them, right? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 tells us that we're buried in baptism with Christ. It says that, that we were baptized into his death. So when I do a baptism, uh, how long do I generally keep somebody in the water? <laughs> I know some of you are laughing because you're thinking it depends on how much I like them. But eventually, I've got to let them up, right? And, and then what happens? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says that we rise to live a new life. We are dead to our old sinful life. That's what, that's what we're, we're, we're saying in baptism. And, and we're alive. We rise to new life with Christ. That's, that's the genius of baptism. In that simple act of obedience, God has made us two promises. One, that when we go down into the water, our sins remain there. And two, when we rise up out of the water, it reflects the promise that when Jesus returns and the trumpet call is sounded, we will rise out of the grave that no earthly tomb can hold us. Eternal life. So here's the deal. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 again. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. God sent his son so that we'd have the promise of eternal life. But God didn't send him because we deserved it. And, and some people, you know, they, they get tripped up on that. You know, that, that's the mistake that a lot of people make. They, they, they think that God doesn't love them because they've sinned or uh, they failed. They've, they've messed things up. They, 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 they believe God doesn't want them as they are. But we read right in the beginning Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 7 tells us none of us have been good enough to be good enough for God to want us as we are. Ephesians tells us that we, before we were Christians, before we accepted Jesus as our Savior, we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. It tells us that we were by our own nature deserving of God's wrath. But that God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love that he has for us, even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace we have been saved. And God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable the immeasurable riches of his grace expressed in kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now that's a perfect gift, the gift of eternal life. What else do you say except Merry Christmas? Joy to the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Thank you for teaching us. Father, now each and every one of us have been confronted somehow, somewhere with your word. Lord, you may be calling us to stop beating ourselves up and to just let go and surrender to you. You may be convicting some of us of some things that we may need to let go of and stop and surrender to you. Father, you may be confirming something within us or to us. Father, however you've spoken to us individually and as a family, we pray that your will would be done. And Father, in Jesus' name, we pray joy to the world. Amen. Would you stand and would you sing with me? Sing with us.